Connecting the Dots with Dr. Wilmer Leon, where the analysis of politics, culture, and history converge. Welcome to the Connecting the Dots podcast with Dr. Wilmer Leon. I am Wilmer Leon. Here's the point. We have a tendency to view current events as though they occur in a vacuum, failing to understand the broader historical context in which most events take place. During each episode, my guests and I will have probing, provocative, and in-depth discussions that connect the dots between current events and the broader historical context in which these events occur. This will enable you to better understand and analyze the events that impact the global village in which we live. On today's episode, the question before us is, what has happened to academic freedom and free speech? For example, there is an article in the Manitobian, the student newspaper of the University of Manitoba, Canada, and it's entitled, You of Manitoba Professor Soft on Putin, an alumnus's thoughts on a professor's interactions with President Putin. My guest is a professor in the Department of Political Studies and director of the Geopolitical Economy Research Group at the University of Manitoba, Winnipeg, Canada. She's an author of numerous books, and she's the subject of this article. She's Dr. Radhika Desai. Dr. Desai, welcome to the show, and let's connect some dots. Absolutely, Wilma. Let's get going. So you and your husband attended the Valdai Discussion Club, an all-expenses-paid trip uh, to Sochi, Russia. You went earlier this month, and this forum, the Valdai Forum, is billed as a wide-ranging conference about international issues. Russian President Putin speaks at the conference every year. Now, as a result of your attending this revered and respected international conference, you and your husband have come under attack. So if you would please, first, let's explain to the audience what is the Valdai Conference. So the Valdai Club is called the Valdai Discussion Club. And as its name indicates, every year, uh, well, first of all, it, it holds discussions, of course, throughout the year. It has a very good website with some leading uh, commentators from around the world posting analyses of what's going on in the world, in the world economy, in world politics, etc. And then every year it has an annual conference to which it's an invitation only event. And uh, of course, the press is there as well. Um, and uh, every year they essentially analyze the the world context in which uh, the fast changing world context shall we say it's been going for 20 years indeed the last conference we went to was the 20th anniversary conference a couple of other things about it that are important is that firstly um because Russia has been, you know, if you think about the last 20 years from 2004 onwards, Russia has really been sort of in the eye of the storm that is changing the world so quickly and so rapidly, particularly over the last few years. So that conference is actually a very fascinating conference to be at because people from, as I say, all over the world, experts and academics and, and even people, former diplomats, etc., all these sorts of people who really know what's going on, attend the Valdai conference conference. So these conversations are absolutely fascinating. And um, second, the second thing I wanted to say is that, uh, of course, uh, the the organization was set up uh, by a, a few academics. As you say, President Putin always speaks at it. And in a certain sense, it will be interesting to think of it as the Russian equivalent of, for example, the Council of Foreign Relations in the United States or the uh, Royal Institute of International Affairs, otherwise known as Chatham House in the United Kingdom. And so you uh, and your husband attended the conference and... You even uh, were able to submit a well. Let me, you you and your husband were able to submit a question to President Putin. And one of the things that for me is utterly amazing is he takes all comers. Uh, the the questions aren't really screened. Uh, you're you're able to ask him anything that's that's relevant to world events, and he will at times speak for two and three hours, just openly engaging with the press. I, I can't imagine, I, I, can, I can't imagine Joe Biden. I can't imagine Barack Obama, Bill Clinton. I could see doing it, but you know, 
be, because it's so it, it it's structured but unstructured. Yeah, you know, I mean, you're absolutely right about that. And I think the fact that we have political leaders who can barely read a teleprompter, let alone talk for four hours to, you know, essentially unscripted questions, this is really quite interesting. But anyway, uh, to, to get to the point, you know, President Putin, uh, you know, I've asked questions before. So I remember earlier uh, in a 2014 Valdai Club conference when I had a previous uh, 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 possibility of asking a question, it was completely unscripted and I had asked him about his economic policies for Russia and why he wasn't being, shall we say, more developmental in his policies. In, in one of my criticisms of President Putin would be that he his economic policies remain a bit too neoliberal even today. I mean, of course, they've become much more developmental than they were in 2014, but that's a small point. But anyway, this time so wait, around... Wait a minute, wait a minute. Uh, wait a minute. It, it's, it's important, I think, for people to realize that not only... Is Vladimir Putin an attorney? He has a PhD in economics. Yes. A lot of people don't does. know that. True, exactly. And and as I say, you know, he's one of, the, I mean, in fact, I have a, a, a very good friend of mine pointed this out to me years ago that, you know, Putin is one of the few people who can simply give uh, uh, speeches that are, you know, really interesting, historically informed, as he did this time around, and then, uh, you know, engage with the audience on, you know, unscripted questions, giving a wealth of information and detail about what his government is doing. So it is really quite interesting. But anyway, this time around, in more recent years, the uh, we have been asked to submit questions. So I submitted a question last year, but I wasn't called upon to, to ask my question. But this year I was called upon. And the, the, the question, you know, I actually hadn't submitted a question when we set off. But then the Canadian Parliament engaged in the most astonishing act. Essentially, the Canadian Parliament, on the occasion of President Volodymyr Zelensky's visit to Canada, invited to Parliament a man, a very old man, a 98-year-old man, who was billed as a great hero, veteran who had fought against the Russians. And the entire Parliament stood up and clapped. And the, by the next day, however, the essentially the, the the you know what had hit the fan and the entire country was a wash with news stories about how this man was a Nazi. Now, how could such a thing happen? The fact of the matter is we have a deputy prime minister who is of Ukrainian heritage, who has a PhD in Russian and Ukrainian studies. There's absolutely no way that the Canadian government did not know that it was bringing a Nazi to parliament. There were Yara, there Yaroslav Hunka is his name. Exactly. So, Mr. Hunka, uh, uh, the pa parliament, you know, not even a single person in the hundreds of people in parliament actually thought to ask, wait a minute. If he was fighting the Russians in the Second World War, <laughs> who was he fighting with? You know, and, and then it emerged that he was a member of the uh, of a certain Galician division in the Waffen SS, and that that uh, this was actually a, a totally a collaborationist Nazi uh, uh, unit which had participated in the genocide of Jews, Russians, Poles. And, you know, uh, and, and of course, Roma, President Putin, in response to my question, also reminded us that an uncounted number of Roma people had also been attacked by these people and, and, and eliminated by these people. So anyway, no one in parliament had the guts to ask this question. And to me and the whole country, of course, was shocked and reeling. And I felt it was really important to give President Putin a chance to have his say on this matter, because which is the country that is most wronged? by this. It is Russia because, of course, the whole uh, uh, the direct target of this action was, of course, Russia. We were applauding Mr. Hanka because he had fought the Russians. So what better thing to do than to ask the president of that country, who, by the way, is also the target of a demonization campaign in the Western media. You know, you never, uh, uh, you know, it's it's as though, you know, Putin is some kind of a macabre, omnipotent person who runs everything in Russia, everything that happens in Russia. And quite frankly, everything that happens abroad, which is not good, is usually attributed to Russia, which is, you know, so. So the point I, is I the even Russian... wonder, I even wonder, you know, was he responsible for the kidnapping of the Lindbergh baby? And did 
did he murder Jimmy <laughs> Hoffa? I mean, he gets, he gets <laughs> accused of everything. Of everything, exactly. And so, you know, and the fact is, we have to remember that if it had not been for the Russian contribution to the Second World War, if it had not been for the Russian effort, which cost Russia anywhere between 25 and 30 million lives. I mean, this We'd is all be lives. speaking Forget German all. now. Well, exactly. I mean, it was the critical contribution to the defeat. I mean, think about it this way. So the Soviet Union rescued the capitalist West from its own, uh, shall we say, it, 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 the, from the very monster that it had created, namely fascism and Nazism. So, so in that sense, you know, uh, and, this, and this current war, which is essentially a proxy war that the US is waging against Russia, using Ukraine as proxies, fighting Russians, as John Mearsheimer likes to say, to the last Ukrainian. In this war, all we hear in the West about Russia is, of course, the wall-to-wall -wall propaganda that is everywhere. It's anti-Putin and it's even anti-Russia. We are deep black forming Dostoevsky and Tchaikovsky. I mean, this is ridiculous. And so it has gone to such a, such an extent. And so my one of our purposes in attending the conference was that we want to remain in touch. We have many friends in Russia. We have had long collaboration with a whole variety of Russian scholars and academics. So we, why shouldn't we go? And um, we, in fact, just a few uh, uh, days before we were to arrive in Russia, the Canadian government imposed sanctions on Russia. And we immediately Immediately got down, you know, the Valdai wrote to us saying we have been sanctioned by your government. If you do not come, we would understand, you know, please make up your mind and let us know whether you'll be coming or not. We sat down and read the sanctions law. We realized that it does not apply to attending a conference. It applies essentially to doing business with providing, you know, buying and selling goods, uh, uh, providing, uh, 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 you know, finance, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So these were the sorts of activities to which it applies. Anyway, so we decided to go. And we went. And so we essentially, I am being pilloried. We are being pilloried for going at all and for asking this question, which, according to the media, gave it was a sort of softball question to Putin, which allowed him to essentially uh, uh, talk about uh, how ridiculous Canada had been. And this was called by some people who are, of course, we can talk about who these people are as well, but they are mm -hmm. highly politically motivated. And this was called morally reprehensible. I asked ask you, what is morally reprehensible for 400 plus people who are the elected representatives of the nation who have the, shall we say, the honor and dignity of the nation to maintain, to indulge in an act like this and, and to applaud uh, Mr. somebody like Mr. Hunker? Uh, 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 or is it reprehensible to ask the president of the country, which is already the target of so much attack, giving him a chance to say something meaningful about how how bad you know Canada's leaders have been essentially the entire political class in Canada in a single act discredited itself i mean this is how bad things have got and as a result of this uh, your prime minister Justin Trudeau apologized profusely called the honoring of Mr Hunka in your parliament a joint session of parliament as an accident. But here's what I find to be really, really confusing is Zelensky was there and Hunka was brought in as a kind of a, a tangential honoring of Zelensky. And what we know very clearly, even though many in Western mainstream media don't want to discuss this, is that with organizations like the right sector and the Azov Battalion in Ukraine, that there are Nazis, many call them neo-Nazis, but they ain't nothing neo about them. They are Nazis who honor the late Stefan Bandera, who was a just brutal, horrific war criminal. And so all of this was orchestrated as a way to pay homage to Zelensky and then pay homage to the Nazis that are that the United States is paying, training, and organizing with in Ukraine. Now, is that rhetoric on my part, 
or is that supported by the data? Absolutely supported by the data. I mean, and by the way, it's not just the United States, the Canada and the oh, yeah, UK absolutely. are all contributing to the training and 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 and, and equipping of these uh, uh, this uh, army of which Nazis are such an important and big part in fact i would say they are the kind of cutting edge of the army so so absolutely this is this is the point but you know the other thing that occurs to me when you were sort of reeling out all these facts is that we are often told when we point out that there are Nazis you know ukraine has a nazi problem uh, we are told, oh, well, of course, Ukraine has no Nazi problem because President Zelensky is Jewish. Is Jewish. So here you are. You want to you want to respect this Jewish gentleman who is uh, uh, who uh, and, and you bring a Nazi and applaud him in front of this guy. Like what kind of a ridiculous thing it is. You know, Wilma, I think, you know, many people, of course, Prime Minister Trudeau said, oh, it was a regrettable mistake. It was a tragic accident, etc. There was nothing uh, uh, accidental about it. The fact of the matter is that nobody gets into parliament without being vetted. The people would have known there's an entire process of vetting. And even if there was no process of vetting, the fact of the matter is that our deputy prime minister, Christia Freeland, is not only of Ukrainian origin in Canada, she is the her, her ancestors have been the beneficiaries of laws that explicitly encouraged Nazis to emigrate to Canada at a time in the post Second World War period, at a time when it was difficult for Jews to emigrate to Canada, uh, Jews who had been fleeing what you know the, what remained of the Jews in in Europe who were fleeing uh, uh, Europe at the time, even they were not welcome in Canada, but the Nazis were welcome. So, and what's more, Christia Freeland. Uh, you know, she is the granddaughter of one of these people. Now, nobody can help who our parents and grandparents are. I mean, that's not her fault. But what she has done is she has consistently maintained that she's very proud of her grandfather. She believes he is a great hero, even though it has been revealed that he too was a close follower of Bandera, uh, was, uh, uh, you know, working very closely with them. All this stuff has come out in the newspapers and it has simply, the mainstream press after, you know, one or two stories are published, they completely sort of, you know, forget about it. And so what, and, so, and, 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 and Christia Freeland also has a PhD in U Russian and Slavic studies. She speaks Russian, she speaks Ukrainian, she speaks many other European languages. Absolutely no way she did not know that Mr. Hunker was this person, was essentially a Nazi. So, so the, I, the idea that it was a mistake, that only the speaker has to resign and then everything is fine, this is completely ridiculous. What, if anything, does this say to you about the broader issue or context of white supremacy? And, and, and what I mean by that is, when I was in high school and learning history, oh, the Nazis were evil, Hitler was evil, all of that is true. Um, and vil they're vilified, Hitler was vilified, the Nazis were vilified, and oh, the one thing you don't want to be called, other than an anti-Semitic, you don't want to be called a Nazi. But what we find out now is the United States worked with them in World War II. The United States ensured safe passage. Uh, and and I, I say United States, and also in that is United States allies, uh, ensured safe passage of a lot of Nazis to the United States, to Canada, to South America. So one then... I think this only begs the question was or was the conflict or is the conflict not so much ideological but procedural uh oh because th th does that make sense I, I I think you got my question yeah I mean I I think that of course uh during the um uh, first of all, in order to understand the Second World War, you have to see see in a certain sense the First World War and the Second World War as a single conflict. Mm -hmm. It was mm -hmm. a single inter-imperialist conflict. So in that sense, uh, you know, the First World War, everybody recognizes that it was an inter-imperialist conflict in which, you know, although uh, Western countries, the Anglo-American 
part of the West continues to maintain the uh, silly idea of German guilt. In reality, all the imperialist powers, the United Kingdom, the United States, Germany, everybody included, were all equally complicit in the outbreak of the First World War. So uh, there was this conflict. And then after it ended, the Versailles, so-called Versailles settlement actually settled very little. It simply laid the foundations of uh, uh, the, simply laid the foundations of the um, uh, of the of the causes that would lead to the Second World War, uh, because it, as I say, it settled very little. So, in that sense, the Second World War also has to be seen as an inter-imperialist conflict with one big difference, and that is that the Soviet Union and also Chinese forces, communist, uh, uh, but also nationalist, but mostly communist, these forces were the ones who were able to turn the tide and save the I, liberal West, I put this in quotes because, but you know, in name at least, these were the liberal West as against the fascist West. And they were able to save the liberal West from the fascist West. But of course, you know, contrary to the notion that somehow uh, 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 fascism and uh, communism are closely connected, in fact, fascism is the progeny of capitalism. Many would say that once you get to the monopoly stage of capitalism, which we were at basically in the early 20th century already. Fascism is inherent in the system. Mm -hmm. uh, it is uh, it is a permanent temptation, a permanent possibility. And it is not surprising, by the way, that today we are seeing the resurgence of fascist forces. So, And, and, and this resurgence is also facilitated by something else you alluded to, which is that uh, so we fought the Nazis. Uh, in the Second World War. But you know that before the onset of the Second World War, many major world leaders were sympathetic to the Nazis. Many mm -hmm. major Western leaders were sympathetic to the Nazis, to the fascists in Italy, and so on. Uh, George uh, Bush's grandfather, Prescott Bush, was sympathetic to the Nazis in World War II. Very interesting. Ex very interesting. I didn't know that. But yes, mm -hmm. or, or, you know, people like Churchill and, and so on. They were, you know, sec secretly or openly the royal family for that matter, everything. So, I mean, you you know this already. Then, of course, there was this terrible war and, and, and the discovery of the Holocaust and all of these things. But even thereafter, in order to preserve capitalism, in order to ensure that the enormous sympathy that communism in general and the Soviet Union in particular had among the masses of Europe would be pushed back. Essentially, the West uh, uh, connived in keeping many fascists in power in countries like Germany, Italy and elsewhere. So in that sense, you know, uh, 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 there was already this collaboration. And, and since that time, I mean, the fact of the matter is that take, for instance, something very recent, the, the Bernie Sanders Trump thing, you know, Sanders campaign as a left wing politician, it was absolutely he was absolutely not allowed to come anywhere near power. I mean, not within sniffing distance of power, but the election of Trump could be tolerated. Uh, uh, you know, and 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 so we see that the uh, uh, the uh, the fascist temptation is always there, and it is uh, the bias of the system is so much to the right, and and today we are in this absolutely awful situation in which we have completely useless leadership. But the only opposition to this completely useless leadership that Western countries have comes from the right, because the left over the last so many decades has been completely beaten down. You know, you began this conversation by asking about academic freedom and freedom of speech. And mm -hmm. what is happening? You know, I should say, by the way, for the record, that my university has maintained the academic freedom stance. And I thank you know, I, I'm glad that it is that is so. So that's very good. However. The uh, the fact that you know uh, you can be pilloried in you know on Twitter and in by by personal emails that I'm sent on Facebook etc uh, for essentially uh, doing something very simple like putting a question in a conference. This kind of behavior, this kind of cancel culture that exists, this is essentially, you can say, it is the verbal version of the sort of vigilante action which is associated with fascism. There's absolutely no doubt about it. There's a, in, in this article that I referenced in the open, uh, 
an alumnus thoughts on professors interactions with Russian president. I'm going to read uh, a bit of it. I'm an alumnus of the Department of Political Studies, and I am a former student of Professor Desai. I cannot say that I aligned with all of her positions at the time, but after finding out that she had spent part of last week shilling for warmongerer Putin, I found her actions to be particularly disgusting. The student continues, former student continues, a discussion club may seem like a noble endeavor in a free and democratic society. However, in Putin's Russia, public discourse is manipulated and dissenters are repressed and punished. I would be shocked if this Valdai forum was anything more than premeditated theater for Putin to stoke his own ego. A uh, couple of things. One, if this was a former student of yours, this individual obviously didn't spend a lot of time paying attention in class. That's the first point. Um, and this idea that th that in Putin's Russia, public discourse is manipulated. I would ask the individual that wrote this if they know anything about Julian Assange and what the United States is doing, what Joe Biden is trying to do to Julian Assange. Then this idea that public discourse is manipulated. This individual obviously knows nothing about what Tony Blinken did before he became Secretary of State, trying to trying to kill the story of uh, Joe Biden's son Hunter in the Hunter Biden laptop story. So all of this is subterfuge uh, and 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 rhetoric, but. This is just one example. There are I, what five or six articles that have been written against you. Uh, speak to that, please. Yeah, I mean, you know, first of all, let me just say that this idea that you know the um, uh, 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 that you know there is no freedom of speech in Russia, and for that matter, in China, I often encounter this because, as it happens, I have a very a big range of uh, academic connections, both in Russia and China, and I visit these countries regularly for conferences and so on. And uh, and what I found is very ironic, but the actual spectrum of opinion in both of these countries, in Russia and China is actually much broader. In all of these countries, you have sort of, you know, open expression of uh, uh, neoliberal positions on the one hand, on the right, and then socialist positions on the other. And, and everything in between is at least expressed. Whereas what we find here is that there is a systematic suppression uh, 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 by the mainstream media of anything but a set of views within a fairly narrow spectrum of opinion. And people like the author of this article, some of the authors of the reporters and others who have written other articles who have been participating in, in an attempt to create a Twitter storm against me, which hasn't been very successful, but nevertheless, the attempt is made. What these people do is they are sort of what I call the ankle biting little yappy dogs of the authorities who kind of try to do some of the the the, the little work for the authorities, you know. So 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 that's what they're trying to do. Now, I, I do want to say one or two other things about it. There is no doubt that there is a certain amount of censorship in Russia. For example, mm -hmm. my very good friend, Boris Kakalitsky, who is one of the contacts, he's a very fine scholar, a very prominent historian, sociologist of Russia. He's also a political activist. He has run for parliament. Uh, he works, uh, you know, he works actively for essentially trying to promote some sort of socialism in Russia. Now, as it happens, he is deeply opposed to this war. I don't, you know, I don't, I mean, I'm, I'm opposed to any war as well. I don't think it's a very good way of settling things. But I don't, by not entirely agreeing with Boris, uh, I think that, you know, I understand his position. Anyway, Boris has essentially been jailed by some part of the state apparatus for essentially a, 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 a allegedly abetting terrorism. Now, I can't believe that. And few people who have been uh, uh, pillaring me for asking Putin this question about what happened in the Canadian parliament mentioned the fact that I had actually two things to ask President Putin. The first was about this uh, uh, matter that we've already discussed about the Canadian parliament. And the second was a personal appeal that he himself look into the matter of Boris Kakalitsky, 
uh, I, we, uh, uh, along with some friends, we delivered a letter to him in which we also pointed out that there was absolutely nothing to be gained by doing this uh, in any case. So, so my point is that there is a certain amount of censorship in these countries. But the, as you rightly point out, such censorship also exists in our country. Look at what we are doing to Julian Assange or Edward Snowden or, or Chelsea Manning or a whole range of other academics who've actually lost their positions for the, uh, for the, uh, for the views they've expressed. Expressed and 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 so on. So I mean, this sort of persecution is going on all the time. But in the West, we don't just have this censorship of what I call the censorship of sticks. We also have the censorship of carrots. And what do I mean by that? Essentially, mm -hmm. the entire uh, uh, media world and the academic world is manipulated by essentially giving out to everybody, you know, give, uh, making it known that if you repeat what we want you to repeat, you will get a good job, you will get promotion, you will get grants, you will get preferment, you will get, you know, you Tenure. will get to hold the book on that is the media. So all of these things are available provided you do certain things. And a lot of people, too many people, I would say most people in academia tend to fall for some version of this. I don't say all mm -hmm. uh, because there are still independent voices in academia and more power to them and more power to us. But nevertheless, too many people fall for this because it's just so easy and it's so convenient. So anyway, the point is that both of these forms of inter uh, uh, censorship exist. And what they have done is they have narrowed the spectrum of opinion. So, you know, uh, uh, and, and this is a very serious problem because the West is now in a, you know, part of the reason why nobody said anything in Parliament is because also in Parliament where our leaders are supposed to, our elected representatives are supposed to speak their mind, to represent the ordinary people, they are essentially not doing their job. So our political systems are broken. As a result, we desperately need to widen the the spectrum of opinion to to have more voices speaking out this is this is key now i think if we continue because it's also fueling the wars that our countries are promoting around the world now we have until recently we had ukraine now we also have israel gaza which is getting to be exceedingly dangerous and tomorrow by the way we might have one with china so and and to your point uh, about censorship and what's going on in Gaza and to uh, your student that talks about uh, suppression in Russia, University of California Berkeley law professor Stephen Davidoff Solomon called out some of his students for supporting anti-Semitic conduct on campus. What this law professor did was wrote a open letter to the law firms that he is in touch with telling them not to hire certain of his students who have proven to be pro-Palestinian. Quote, my students are largely engaged and well-prepared and I regularly recommend them to legal employers. But if you don't want to hire people who advocate hate and practice discrimination, don't hire some of my students. Anti-Semitic conduct is nothing new on university campuses, including here at Berkeley. That's just one example of the, 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 the stifling pressure that academics are imposing upon their own students. We know what happened at Harvard. Thank God the president of Harvard, I think her last name is Get, Professor uh, uh, President Gay, did not succumb to the request and the pressure to turn over the names of Harvard students that were Pal that were support that were protesting in support of Palestine. I believe the same thing has uh, has happened at Columbia University. So these are just examples of uh, real clear examples of of how stifling the pressure can be in the United States. Absolutely. And when you do that with students, it's a, it's a bit like, you know, get them young so that, you know, sort of slap them into shape before they, they get into bad habits sort of thing, according to the 
to, to the authorities. But, you know, this sort of thing is going on around the world. In the UK, they're trying to ban uh, the Palestinian flag and trying to essentially, uh, you know, they are, uh, 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 they're, they're persecuting people for going to pro-Palestinian demonstrations. But you know what, Wilmoth, around the world, what we are seeing, uh, especially in the Western world, is that the Western world's leaderships, which are all repeating the same mantra of, you know, Israel has the right to defend itself, completely ignoring the context, uh, uh, etc., the historical context and, and, and everything, uh, they are completely out of touch with the vast majority of the people. And they're ignoring international law. Out. And indeed, and and they, uh, in fact, absolutely, they 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 are they keep saying that they should um, uh, uh, they should uh, uh, abide by international law. But the fact of the matter is, that Israel is not abiding by international law. It has already declared that it is at war. But at the same time, it is essentially uh, uh, by 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 corralling all the people of Gaza into Gaza, not allowing them to leave, depriving them of water, electricity, sanitation, bombing hospitals, killing children, over 2,000 of them already. This is completely against international law. And, it is uh, called is collective is punishment. And exactly. collective punishment is a war crime. Now... I don't think go. I don't think you're making that up. I know I'm not making that up. If you pay any attention to the International Criminal Court, if you know anything about and this conversation is not anti-Semitic, it's pro it's pro law. It's pro international law and collective exactly. punishment is a war crime. Absolutely. And it is pro law and it is also pro justice. I mean, at the end of the day, what what these and pro morality and pro morality they, they decontextualize everything hamas everything begins in this discussion of the west today everything begins from the 7th of october when uh, hamas uh, 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 attacked uh, uh, israelis and killed many of them and so on but the fact this the fact that Palestinians have been living, have, Palestinians have had their land occupied since 1948 and before 1948. This is completely forgotten. The fact that Palestinians have been displaced, that the Palestinians have the right to resist and they have the right to self-determination. All of these things are completely swept under the carpet. It is really shocking. And this is entirely a result of the fact that um, uh, 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 th that the spectrum of opinion has been narrowed. The forms of censorship that I pointed out earlier operate both in media and in scholarship. So that more and more we are hearing either completely irrelevant things or things that are only repeating what the authorities want repeated. And let me give an, let me give an example of that. President Obama uh, published an op-ed, Thoughts on Israel and Gaza, and I'm going to read the three opening paragraphs. It's been 17 days since Hamas launched its horrific attack against Israel, killing over 1,400 Israeli citizens, including defenseless women, children, and the elderly. In the aftermath of such unspeakable brutality, the U.S. government and the American people have shared in the grief of families, prayed for the return of loved ones, and rightly declared solidarity with the Israeli people. As I stated in an earlier post, Israel has a right to defend its citizens against such wanton violence, and I fully support President Biden's call for the U.S. to support our longtime ally in going after Hamas, dismantling its military capabilities, and facilitating the safe return of hundreds of hostages. Final paragraph. But even as we support Israel, we should also be clear how Israel prosecutes this fight against Hamas matters. In particular, it matters as President Biden has repeatedly emphasized that Israel's military strategy abides by international law, including those laws that seek to avoid, to every extent possible, the death or suffering of civilian populations. It's, it, I just wanted to read the opening here because this is really where I formulated the earlier question to you about white supremacy and this being not a matter of ideology, but a matter of strategy. Because what I take away, there are a number of fallacies in what Obama wrote, but what I take away in that last paragraph is Obama saying this, slaughter, the, slaughter Hamas as you want to, 
just be a little nicer in how you go about doing it. But it gets worse than that, Wilma, because the very mm -hmm. next paragraph, so, you know, it says all of these things that, you know, uh, we, we should try to avoid as much as possible. Not try to avoid, only try to avoid as much as possible, which is already a big qualifier. But then or don't do it because point. you're violating international law. That's right. <laughs> Yeah, so that? he already is giving Israel a free pass there. But then he says, this is an enormously difficult task. So trying to, uh, to minimize the suffering of the civilian population is already too difficult. So it may not be possible to minimize it anyway. And, and then he says, the United States has fallen short of this high values when we are engaged in war. And then he says, it is understandable that Israelis have demanded that their governments do whatever it takes to root out Hamas. And, uh, and then he repeats the, oh my God, if I hear it one more time, my head will explode. They are using civilians as human shields. shields. So he repeats this, this old trope that, that the Israeli of, uh, government uh, uh, sources never fail to repeat. And so, uh, so the thing is that this whole thing is really a gift uh, he's doing nothing, you know, uh, he, he seems to be calling for sympathy for Palestinians and so on. But Israel has rights. Palestinians only have our sympathies. And there is a big difference. You know, sympathy is at the end of the day an empty sentiment, especially if it is not backed up with action of real support, of real solidarity, of a real even handed attempt to try to, I mean, you know, the whole thing is, you know, I said I talked about the earlier history, the fact that Palestinians have been uh, 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 have had their occupied. land occupied for decades. Yeah. So all of these things are true. And throughout this time, the United States has always intervened in this situation in a way that is heavily loaded in favor of Israel while trying as best as possible to make a show of even handedness. The fact of the matter is that, uh, you know, uh, 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 this this article by Obama, uh, which completely supports the Biden administration, essentially is, uh, do, is just repeating what the Biden administration is doing. And it is simply uh, 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 showing the pronounced U.S. bias in favor of, 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 of Israel. And he says at one point, you know, he says that we should try to minimize civilian casualties because, you know, uh, it will otherwise alienate the people of the world. You know, the fact of the matter it's is... It's bad for business. Yeah, and it's bad for business, but also the fact is that this is, you know, at, at this rate, there will, you know, and he says that there will not be enough actors in the region who will, who, uh, who support Israel's right to exist, which will, who, who, and also support the Palestinians will not be able to broker a deal. But at the rate at which the United the Israel is going, and the way in which the United States is completely behind Israel, there will be very few actors in the region who will continue to recognize Israel's right to exist because the street will not allow them. The ordinary people, I already read in today's newspaper a report that the uh, Tunisian parliament is going to outlaw uh, any kind of uh, uh, normalization of relations with Israel and also essentially prevent its citizens from engaging in any kind of contact with Israelis. So this is already one of the reactions. And I would say that if, uh, uh, you know, as the collective punishment of Gaza continues, of or, um, as children continue to be killed, in Gaza, the whole world is going to turn against Israel. You know, uh, it's not good for Israel, actually, uh, for, no. for, for the way in which this is unfolding, you know. Libya, I believe, has taken a similar action as Tunisia is, is taking. And we know that based upon the Abraham Accords that uh, uh, the United States was trying to broker rapprochement between Saudi Arabia and the Zionist colony of Israel, and that as a result of Hamas's action, the Saudis have put that whole thing on hold, because to your point, they see what's happening in the street, and they don't want to be overthrown following the United States down this rabbit hole. And they see what's happened in Ukraine. They see what the United States is doing relative to Taiwan. And they see that's a formula for World War III. 
Absolutely. You know, and I just like to add one other thing. You know, we I, I mentioned street, you mentioned street. The fact, uh, the, the, what we know is that, you know, there are many, uh, uh, many of the governments of the Middle East, including Arab countries, would have been happy to compromise with Israel. But what has held them back, what has kept the Palestinian cause uh, on the front burner throughout all this uh, time is popular protest. And we talk about how the Arab street has been essentially the, 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 the defender of the Palestinian cause, the, the people who have essentially not allowed it to be snuffed out. But today, I would say that people in the West are also fed up with this mm -hmm. one-sided support. I mean, I'm reading in the papers not only about, you know, big demonstrations in the capitals and big cities of Middle Eastern countries, but throughout Europe as well. And also in North America. I mean, you folks, you've had huge demonstrations in your big mm -hmm. cities in the United States. We've had big demonstrations. London apparently had a demonstration that was 300,000 strong, which is the biggest demonstration of its sort uh, since the 2003 February 2003 demonstrations against the Iraq war, which were historic, as you will remember. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So, uh, so, so these, so, and, and, and already, you know, it's such an irony because uh, Keir Starmer has become the leader of the Labour Party precisely on the anti-Semitism bandwagon, where anybody who supports Palestine is essentially branded as anti-Semite. Uh, Keir Starmer uh, and his gang have essentially uh, 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 essentially participated in a process of pushing out Jeremy Corbyn as the leader of the Labour Party on these completely flimsy grounds. But today, Starmer is facing a revolt from within his own party because he, like all the other Western leaders, uh, is essentially backing the uh, the U.S. position and the Israel position without question. I mean, people are saying, look, folks, you there's got to be a ceasefire. There's got to be a negotiated settlement. Anybody with, you know, a, 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 a small amount of knowledge of the Palestinian-Israeli uh, situation can easily see that. But uh, the leaders cannot, and they are really getting, is a, say, completely unstuck from the people whose support they will need come the next election. The title of the show is Connecting the Dots. Is, is, is it hyperbolic for me to look at, again, Ukraine, look at what the United States is trying to do with Taiwan, and look at how now the United States is involved in this conflict in Palestine and see similar traits. And I'm just using the three most recent events. I don't have to go too far back in history. I can talk about Afghanistan. I can talk about Iraq. But just looking at where we are right now, again, Ukraine, Taiwan, and Palestine. Am I wrong to connect those dots? Absolutely not. And you know what? All three of them are interesting proxy wars. And by the way, the United States has developed the idea or uh, de developed the practice of proxy wars into a fine art because, you know, the United States used Islamic fundamentalists to fight Russia in Afghanistan, for example, and, and other uh, such. Uh, 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 in, there have been many such ways in which they have uh, they have done so. So. In the present context, yes. So the United, the United States, States is doing that in Russia. Congo right now. It, yes, the, exactly. Doing the same thing the, in Congo. The United States is fighting Russia via uh, using Ukrainians. The United States hopes one day to fight Thai, uh, China using uh, the Taiwanese. And today, think about this. What is probably given the possibility that, you know, if uh, uh, Israel uh, 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 stages a land invasion of Gaza today, it may be very difficult for Iran to stay uninvolved. And Iran has been the consistent defender of Palestinian rights throughout this period. Really an important and interesting point. Now, in this context, then what will happen? The United States will use Israelis to fight Iran. And so, you know, again, you know, as I like to say, everyone who's uh, in our countries, you know, in the U.S. and Canada, who's saying, you know, we are standing up for uh, Ukraine, uh, uh, you know, et cetera, et cetera. They are the ones contributing to the destruction of Ukraine. And it may ironically be the case that everyone who will say we stand up for uh, Israel's rights to exist, et cetera, et cetera, and to defend itself will essentially be contributing to the destruction of Israel. So there's there may be one of the biggest ironies of all. You mentioned uh, 
people standing up and saying that they're trying to prevent the destruction of Ukraine, but what they are also supporting in that is the destruction of the United States. Because when you look at the budget, when you, I think very recently, or Joe Biden's now trying to get another $125 billion to be sent to Ukraine. And people need to understand what this money is doing. The United States is paying the salaries of Ukrainian civil servants. The United States is paying for the pensions of uh, Ukrainian civil servants when the UAW is on strike in the United States trying to get pensions restored in the United States. Um, all of this uh, under the pretext of democracy and defending democracy when it was the United States in 2014 with the Maidan coup that went in and overthrew the democratically elected Yanukovych government in Ukraine, which was the precipitant to where we are today. The, the hypocrisy in all of this is nauseating. You know, and and also, you know, when they say the, I mean, anybody knows when the United States say, says that it's defending human rights and democracy, what it's really doing is, first of all, it's using usually some sections of the middle class as essentially uh, uh, the protesters who will protest against the government that the United States does not like, etc. So they are, again, using them as instruments and appealing to their liberal principles, etc. But more to the point, the by the kinds of rights and freedoms the United States wants to see uh, realized in all the other countries of the world are those rights and those freedoms of U.S. corporations to go there and do as they please, uh, uh, engage in whatever economic activity that they want to and all sorts of exploitative activities that they want to get into. So though that's what the defense of human you know, uh, freedom and human rights actually amounts to anyway. And then on top of that, you know, the irony is that the United States requires all the, uh, its partner countries, whoever, you know, whoever wants anything from the United States must enact neoliberal policies. What are neoliberal policies? They are precisely the policies that make democracy impossible. Because in a capitalist society, you cannot have anything like a functioning democracy without making some substantial material concessions in the form of good wages, good welfare states, etc., to the ordinary people. But this is precisely what is made impossible. So what is there for ordinary people to vote for? And... That's that's a, that's a great great point, and there's something else I think from a from a societal and a cultural perspective that needs to be taken into account here, and that is the United States. And this has been a stated objective since this whole Ukraine conflict started. The United States wants to engage in regime change in Russia. They want to get rid of Vladimir Putin. But I've seen independent polls, and when I mean independent, I mean from Princeton University and other U.S. Ivy League institutions that say over 86% of Russian people support their government. I've seen independent polls from, uh, from, from again, American institutions, 96% of the Chinese people support President Xi and the Chinese government. Uh, we tried to overthrow um, al-Assad in Syria. He won the last election with 86% of the vote. And I have friends of mine that were election observers in Syria who said free and fair election. Same thing with uh, Maduro in Venezuela, free and fair elections. The, so my point is their forms of democracy because of their histories and their cultures are different than our form of democracy, but that doesn't mean they're not valid. That doesn't mean they're not supported by the people. And that means they that that does not mean that they should not be supported by us. Absolutely. I mean, I remember I used to teach a course on democracy and capital 
capitalism. And my students had to read this particular text by written in the 70s by C.B. McPherson, a very important Canadian Marxist philosopher, but also very widely respected. And you read there in the, you know, in the 70s, it was completely natural for people to say, you know what, we may have our form of democracy, but it is a liberal democracy. But in the communist countries, which existed at that time, they, they also have their own form of democracy. And that's a different one. And third world countries are trying to realize their own forms of democracy. So this type of pluralism had to be accepted because the fact that the Soviet Union existed was an important restraint, constituted an important restraint on the West and on the United States. The moment the Soviet Union has ceased to exist, the United States has gone full-fledged into this completely delusional uh, quest for supremacy around the world, which is an impossible quest. The, the United States can never enjoy that form of supremacy. But the problem with the United States is failing that it has no plan B. So US leaders keep trying to achieve that supremacy, as you rightly put it, destroying the United States itself in that pr process. But also, I would say, uh, of course, uh, causing mayhem around the world, causing economic crises, wars, financial crises across the board, essentially making people's lives a misery. I mean, it's no wonder that uh, China is today welcomed with open arms in so many countries where the United States and the West more generally have uh, historically visited very little but abuse on these countries. We have just about probably four minutes left. And you saying that just made me think when you listen to President Putin, he talks about the shift away from the unipolar dynamic to a multipolar dynamic. When you listen to President Xi, he talks about the shifting away from a unipolar dynamic to a multipolar dynamic. And I just heard Joe Biden say recently, you know, we're getting the sense that the world is shifting and we need to consider a new world order. Hmm, I've heard that before. And then he says, and the and the new world order needs to be led by the United States. I, th I said, Joe Biden, man, you are, if not senile, you are at least out of your mind. <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> Absolutely. I mean, as I say, there is a certain level of delusion. I mean, recently, I did, I can't remember the exact words, but President Joe Biden was asked whether the United States could fight a two front war. And he said, of course, we are. Of course we, we, are the, of course we can. We are the United States. I mean, the fact of the matter is, Wilma, if you think about it, and you're the historian, I'm not. But if you think about it, the United States has never won a single war, which it has fought on its no. own. I mean, not counting, you know, it, it was it, since, it, it since World really War Two. Since World yeah, War Two, the United States, maybe we could say Grenada, and maybe we could say Panama. Other than those two, the United States hasn't won a thing. Where didn't win Vietnam. Uh, I, I, I could I could tick off the list. Didn't win Afghanistan. Uh, didn't win Iraq. Uh, we're we're like zero for five. And 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 so the question arises. You know, we are told in the same breath that the United States. Um, the, we are told that the United States is um, uh, uh, spends almost a trillion dollars a year on its military. What good does that do if the United States can't win wars? What if the United States spent a trillion dollars on its infrastructure? Dr. Radhika Desai, how can people reach you and connect and uh, read your work? Uh, well, uh, my email is very easy to find. So if you just Google Radhika Desai University of Manitoba, you'll find my email. And my website is radhikadesai.com. I want to thank my guest, Dr. Radhika Desai, for joining me today. And thank you all so much for listening to the Connecting the Dots podcast with me, Dr. Wilmer Leon. Stay tuned for new episodes every week. Also, please follow and subscribe, leave a review, share my show, follow us on social media. You'll find all the links below in the show description. And remember, folks, this is where the analysis of politics, culture, and history converge, because talk without analysis is just chatter and we don't chatter on connecting the dots. See you again next time. Until then, I'm Dr. Wilmer Leon. Have a good one. Peace.
Connecting the Dots with Dr. Wilmer Leon, where the analysis of politics, culture, and history converge.